Welcome to Archaeoed, a podcast about the civilizations of the ancient Americas. You know, the ones that Western history books spend about a page discussing. I'm your host, Dr. Ed Barnhart. I've been an archaeologist, an explorer, and a seeker of esoteric knowledge all around the Americas for over 30 years now. This podcast is just me, freed from the lecture podium and talking like we're just having a beer together. Sometimes I'll tell stories of my adventures. Other times I'll share what I've learned about the various cultures that were here before Columbus. Basically, it'll be anything I feel like talking about, because this is my podcast, Beholden the No One. I'm just having fun with it. I hope you do too. So without further ado, kick back, relax, and let's get started. Season 4, Episode 3, Mississippian Burial Patterns. Last episode, I was talking about Mississippian religion. I mentioned how important burial practices were, and then never talked about it again. That bugged me, so I decided to do a whole episode on that topic. Human burial traditions are about what we believe happens to us when we die, and that is driven by our religion. When you think about it, a lot of things we do in life are driven by what we think will happen to us when we die. Christians try to be nice people, or they'll go to a scary place called hell. Muslims participate in an arduous pilgrimage called the Hajj to increase their chances of going to heaven. The Aztecs believed that sacrificed warriors became part of the proud army who escorted the sun across the sky. Ghost stories are always about sad souls who didn't finish what they were supposed to do in life. You get the picture. How we live is dictated by how we die. And the living conduct funerals to help the dead along their way. For virtually all the civilizations of the Americas, that road to the land of the dead was the Milky Way. But that's another podcast episode. I must admit, I hesitated to do this episode about burials. It's a very sensitive topic. Fans of archaeology love nothing more than the discovery of some fabulous tomb. And I get that. They are really cool. But the facts are that the bodies in those tombs were somebody's loved ones. It's amazing to see a richly adorned skeleton from long ago, but it would be considerably less cool if it was your grandma that everybody was staring at. And I'm not up on my high horse here. I've dug my share of burials. I don't like skeletons. They're creepy and gross. But tombs are where the art is, and art is my favorite part of archaeology. I did some research for this episode and found some alarming statistics. For starters, there are over 600,000 human remains in U.S. museum collections today. And that's just museums. Add to that laboratories and state repositories, and you're definitely over a million. Then go global with all that, and it's for sure millions of bodies dug up by archaeologists now collecting dust in basements across the planet. And honestly, I'm, I'm not proud of that. In the 1990s, the U.S. passed a long overdue law protecting Native American burials. It's called NAGPRA, Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act. In 1992, I took a work-study job at TARL, Texas Archaeological Research Laboratory. That's the repository for all artifacts found by the state of Texas. My job was to hunt the collection, millions of objects, for NAGPRA compliance. I was to find burials for repatriation. At first, I really liked that job analyzing artifact collections to determine if they were burials. I found a bunch with no bones, but assemblages that indicated grave goods. I was finding lots to repatriate. Then the director took me aside and said, Ed, we didn't hire you to be a detective. 
No bones, no report. You got it? Well, I got him all right. Soon after that, I, I quit that job and started delivering pizzas. It paid better, and I felt better about it. Nagpra is well-intentioned, but it became a can of worms in more ways than what I experienced at Tarl. When it comes to the graves of the Mississippians, the problem became exactly who would receive the repatriated remains. No less than a dozen modern tribes claim ancestry to the Mississippians, and with good reason. But ironically, those multiple legitimate claims have resulted in the bones being repatriated to no one. Institutions have been able to take a, well, you people sorted out stance, retaining the bones in the meantime. A few collections have been returned, but most are still in legal limbo. Okay, well, with that long-winded preface, let's get into Mississippian burial patterns. Everything I just said about the tragic circumstances through which Mississippian burials were exhumed was true. But practically speaking, it's water under the bridge. At least if we can learn from them, they weren't for nothing. So just in case you're listening to this episode as a one-off, let me quickly place the Mississippians in time and space. Their civilization existed between 900 and, let's say, 1600 CE. They occupied an area from the Mississippi River to the East Coast and from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up to Canada. They buried their important people in mounds, an archaeological term that I really don't like. I've been trying to push the term pyramids instead, but that gets a lot of pushback and I recognize it's not perfect. Maybe I should go with pyramid mounds. I don't know. It's a revolution in progress. And like most revolutions, it's messy and underfunded. Anyhow, the Mississippians were not the first civilization to bury their dead in pyramid mounds. In fact, I believe that tradition evolved over thousands of years. Want to hear my theory? I'm going to believe you said yes right there. All right, then. Thousands of years ago, when the megafauna all died off, the people of North America had to find new things to eat. They still had plants to gather, but they were used to meat being a large part of their diet. In eastern North America, clams and oysters became their go-to protein source. They got them from the ocean on the coasts and the rivers in the interior. The shells piled up. Larger communities made literal mountains of them. Archaeology calls them simply shell mounds. The shell mounds were trash heaps, but they probably became landmarks too. Eventually, they started putting their dead inside them. Once they did that, the mounds became touch points for their ancestors. It connected people to places in sacred ways. By about 6,000 BCE, people were living around rivers in Tennessee and Kentucky and commonly burying people in their shell mounds. That was the status quo for thousands of years. But then about 800 BCE, the Adena civilization evolved in and around modern-day Ohio. They still had the tradition of burying in mounds, but they didn't rely on shell foods anymore. So they decided to build burial mounds out of earth. I'll take my first commercial break right here, and when I return, we'll continue talking about the evolution of burial mounds. Yes, it's another commercial of me promoting me. This time, it's an ask to support Archaeoed through Patreon. I've discovered that a lot of my listeners don't know what Patreon is, so let me explain. Simply put, Patreon is a website that allows fans to financially support their favorite creators, musicians, artists, comics, and podcasters like me. 
Like the NPR model, it allows for one-time donations or monthly charges on your credit card called sustaining memberships. Those sustaining memberships are wonderful because they create a monthly budget that creators can depend on and plan around. You can support ArcheoEd with as little as $5 a month or as much as you like. The process is really very simple. Just make an account with Patreon and choose ArcheoEd as your recipient. But you might be saying, but wait a second, ArcheoEd is free. Why would I choose to pay for it? Because, again, just like NPR, quality programming doesn't exist without public support. I made this podcast on a lark, sitting in my closet during the pandemic. But now it has tens of thousands of fans and dozens of Patreon supporters. ArcheoEd's success is starting to prove that responsible, truthful portrayals of ancient history can be popular and financially viable. Aliens, ghosts, and white guys that built Atlantis are not the only things that history fans want to hear about. So why support ArcheoEd through Patreon? so I can have the financial resources to expand my reach and increase the audience. With your help, I can challenge the notion that only sensationalized versions of ancient history sell. It's easy. Just Google Patreon Archaeoed and you're on your way. I'm betting on the fact that you would agree that Archaeoed is at least as valuable to you as a cup of Starbucks once a month. So come on, put a little skin in the game and help me challenge those other strange versions of history. Okay, I'm back and we're talking about Adena burial practices. As I said, about 800 BCE, they were the first Eastern North American culture to bury their dead in earthen mounds. They were also the first to build charnel houses. These were rectangular buildings built of wooden planks and logs where the bodies of the dead were prepared for burial. The term charnel comes from medieval French for graveyard. In Europe, Charnel houses were places where bodies were moved from overcrowded graveyards. They'd give them a few years to become skeletons and then move the bones to the charnel house. Catacombs are technically charnel houses. They're just underground and bigger. The places we call charnel houses in ancient America are somewhat different in purpose. They were places where priests would privately prepare bodies for burial. Sometimes that was just cleaning them up, but more often it involved defleshing the bodies and cremating the bones. Burial bundles were also prepared in charnel houses. The Adena burial mounds were all conical, with no structure on top. When they're excavated, we find multiple layers of bodies and groups, and at the core we find burned charnel houses. In a few cases, instead of charnel houses, we find formal tombs made of logs, or in one case, a stone-lined chamber. Those tombs also included more burial goods, furthering the idea that they were special people like leaders or priests. The burial offerings tend to be things like tobacco pipes, bird effigies in copper and mica, and piles of unused chert arrowheads and axe heads. The typical Adena mound starts with a burned charnel house, buried with a few bodies inside. Then the next layer will be a bunch of bodies buried all at once, typically 20 or 30 individuals. And that's interesting because they probably didn't all die at once. They don't show evidence of violence, so they weren't all killed in some episode or event or a, or a war. Logically, that means that they were storing bodies for a time, likely in a charnel house. But why would they wait to bury a whole group at once? By the way, they were both men and women of varying age, so there are really no patterns there. 
Since this is my shoot-from-the-hip podcast, I'll share my half-baked theory. What if they were waiting for a specific astronomically related time of year to lay them to rest? In particular, I think they were waiting for the Milky Way to line up in a north-south orientation. That makes sense to me because 28 years ago, I wrote a paper theorizing that the Milky Way was seen as the road of the dead for almost every culture in the Americas, specifically in that north-south orientation. Earlier this year, my friend and colleague William Romaine wrote a paper theorizing that Mississippian mound alignments to the Milky Way in that same north-south alignment were existent. A side note here, after I wrote that last little part, I emailed Bill to see what he thought. I asked him if he saw any of those alignments of the Milky Way involved with burial mounds. His reply was cordial, but between the lines he said, Yeah, Ed, I've written multiple papers on that subject, and thanks for not reading them. Am I nuts? Yes. Am I right? Maybe. Bill seems to think so. Anyhow, I digress. Back to Adena burial mounds. Adena mounds typically have two or three layers of burials with years in between them. After the final group, it would be capped with a smooth clay surface. Kind of like stucco, but more clay and less limestone. At about 100 BCE, the Adena evolve into Hopewell civilization. In many ways, it's a, it's a Dina 2.0. The Hopewell constructed massive geometric earthwork enclosures, the largest in world history, in fact. They also created a trade network that spanned hundreds of miles, especially along the southern Mississippi River in a Hopewell variation we call Marksville culture. But still, they built Adena-style conical burial mounds and filled them with dozens of graves. Hopewell civilization persisted until about 600 CE. Add to that the 800 BCE Adena beginning, and we have 1,400 years of conical burial mounds. That's the distance between the fall of the Roman Empire and the invention of the telephone. Quite a lot of time. Why Hopewell civilization ended is still unclear, though two game-changing technologies arrived in their heartland at just that same time, corn agriculture and the bow and arrow. It's easy to come up with ways that those transformative technologies could have disrupted Hopewell society, but how to prove it is harder. I swear I'm working my way towards the Mississippians, but I still have two important areas to discuss that preceded them. One is the effigy mounds found in Wisconsin and surrounding states. They were constructed between 600 and 900 CE, in between Hopewell and Mississippian times. There were once over 15,000 of them. Now there are less than 4,000. They're all shaped like animals, and the vast majority contain a single burial placed where the animal's heart would be. They're not big or tall. Most of them are barely visible today. But they're in interesting clusters of the same animal, groups of bears or turtles or birds, etc. The modern Ho-Chunk people claim direct ancestry to the effigy mounds and tell us that the animals represent the clans that the dead came from. They also say that the effigy burial mounds are medicine given to them by their creator. Not like ibuprofen, like spiritual fortification. That same word, medicine, is used when describing burial bundles. Our ancestral remains medicine? These kinds of Native American statements make it seem like maybe that's true. These effigy mounds are far from their creator's community, just like Adena and Hopewell mounds, which is an important distinction I'll get back to in a moment. <laughs> 
The last piece of the puzzle that I want to set up before finally getting to the Mississippians is the lower Mississippi River region. Now, the oldest occurrences of tall earthen pyramid mounds are in the lower Mississippi River Basin, especially Louisiana. Poverty Point's massive Mound A was built by 1500 BCE. That's 3,500 years ago. Watson Brake is older. A new study of the LSU campus mounds is saying that they may have even started at 11,000 years before today. That one, let's wait for the other shoe to drop. But in all these cases, there are no burials in the mounds. And also, their mounds are inside their communities, not some distance away. So we have these different mound-building traditions floating around the eastern United States, all about to coalesce into Mississippian civilization. By the way, all these cultures I've been talking about so far are collectively called woodlands cultures in typical archaeology textbooks or Google searches, just in case you want to do some research on your own and get confused by this term woodlands cultures. So to me, the cultural revolution that happened at Cahokia began at a place to its south called Toltec Mounds. Toltec starts about 600 CE, just as Hopewell civilization fades away. And it's a real hybrid. It's got 18 mounds along a bayou, surrounded on three sides by a tall earthen berm. Only one of those mounds, Mound C, is a burial mound. The earthen berm is like a Hopewell geometric earthwork enclosure, but just where later Mississippian wooden palisades would go. It's got a burial mound but it's surrounded by a population center, not somewhere outside of it. And importantly, there's evidence of later Mississippian people returning to an abandoned Toltec and interring more burials. They for sure thought it was something special. Now about 900 CE, Cahokia begins. At first, it's modestly sized and a lot like Toltec. The big difference is that they're corn farming. The confluence of multiple rivers at that location, now right next to the modern city of St. Louis, was ideal for corn farming. It still is, in fact. But at roughly 1050 CE, something big happens. The people of Cahokia rip down their entire community and build a bigger, better city on top of it. And at the exact same time, Toltec mounds are abandoned. A sizable, very organized community just leaves. Where did they go? Well, it's a good bet they went to Cahokia. The fact that ceramic types from Toltec start showing up at Cahokia just at that same time supports that hypothesis. Okay, I've finally set the stage to talk about Mississippian burial patterns. I'll take my last commercial break here, and when I return, we'll talk about how Cahokia decided to sacrifice hundreds of people, mostly women. Surprise! It's still in. People are traveling again, and my tours are filling up as fast as I can post them. For those that can travel on short notice, I recommend the Yucatan tours I'm leading for Wonderum Journeys in November and December. Wonderum, formerly The Great Courses, has just started a new travel program initiative with professors leading their trips. I was honored to be the first professor picked to lead their tours. I made an eight-episode travel show for them called Exploring the Maya World, which followed me through the Yucatan. In November and December, I'll be leading Wonderum journeys along that same path. We'll be staying in luxury hotels, eating at gourmet restaurants, and of course, exploring the ruins. 
In the evenings, I'll present lectures that further explain what we see during the day trips. Both trips still have space, and I'd be happy to have you along. If you'd like to learn more, check out the details at the website wonderumjourneys.com, and I'll put a link to that in my show notes as well. Come explore the Yucatan with me. Tim Palkatet calls what happened at Cahokia the Big Bang, and I have to agree. It was the spark that started the Mississippian universe. As I said, at about 1050 CE, they dramatically scrapped their existing structures and built new ones. The new city was on a scale never seen before. They built a massive pyramid, hundreds of houses and platform mounds. They built wood hinges, a two-mile diameter palisade wall made of 20,000 tree trunks, and most importantly to my subject here, lots of burial mounds. The most famous of those burial mounds is Mound 72. Though it stood less than six feet tall, there were over 250 burials inside. In the center, lowest part of the mound, were its primary occupants, clearly elite, and perhaps even the early rulers of Cahokia. It's called the Beaded Burial because of a carpet of 22,000 tiny shells separating the two central bodies. That was probably a blanket of some sort that they were wrapped in. The other name for that burial is the Birdman Burial, based on early ideas that the shell beads were laid down in the form of a thunderbird. Honestly, I've never really saw that. In addition to that fab blanket, there were chunky discs, copper plates, hundreds of arrow points, stone carvings, and many other burial goods. It's really one of the richest tombs ever found in North America. Up until quite recently, the two individuals were believed to be male. Taken along with the warrior and thunderbird imagery, the interpretation was that it was symbolically the twin brothers from Mississippian mythology. The problem with that theory is one of them turned out to be a woman. So the hero twins theory went out the window, but it was replaced with an equally important one. The idea that Cahokia had an exalted royal family. Around that buried pair, now a couple, we find a few other buried couples and at least one child, all respectfully buried. Maybe other elite family members? But that's where the pageantry ends and Mound 72 gets macabre and dark. Sometime shortly after the beaded burial is closed, four other pits around it were dug and filled with sacrificed young women. On one side, fifty women, apparently strangled, were laid in and stacked in two layers like matchsticks. On the other side, sixty-five more strangled young women are interred in three other pits. All four of those pits were then covered with small mounds. If that wasn't bad enough, the final pit seems downright brutal. In that one, it's men and women both this time, but they were clearly killed right on the spot. They were shot with arrows and hit in their heads. All have cracked skulls or broken bones. Unlike the sacrificed women, they were just thrown in the pit. And horrifyingly, some were clearly trying to climb out over the other bodies. They were still alive when they went in the pit. The other weird thing was four males, buried side by side, decapitated, and their hands were chopped off. After all of this, finally, one big mound went all over them, Mound 72, and it was capped with clay and then it becomes what we've termed a ridgetop mound. 
So, needless to say, this was one horrific sacrifice scene, at least to Western eyes. But what's interesting is, though it gets a disproportionate amount of discussion, it's actually the only clear case of Mississippian mass sacrifice. I've looked, and looked again just for this episode, and other than Mound 72 at Cahokia, there's really very little evidence of any other sacrifices, let alone mass sacrifices. Within Cahokia itself, there are about nine other burial mounds. You can tell because they're ridgetop mounds. The French immigrant farmers called them barn mounds because they were shaped like barns. Most are still unexcavated, but a few were quickly dug as salvage projects in the 1920s and 30s. They, too, had hundreds of burials, but they were secondary burials, not sacrifices. A secondary burial is a body that is first prepared somewhere, like a charnel house, and then buried somewhere else. In the case of the Mississippians, most of the secondary burials were found were bundle burials. A typical bundle burial was made by defleshing the body and wrapping the skull and long bones in an animal skin. Sometimes items from their lives or ritual art was also wrapped into the bundle. Like the Adena and Hopewell before them, the burial bundles were often interred in groups. Looking at other major Mississippian cities contemporaneous with Cahokia also fails to find much in the way of sacrifices. Burial mounds, plenty. But sacrifices, not clearly. A notable exception is the Dixon Mounds, less than a hundred miles north of Cahokia. Hundreds of graves were found there, and among them four decapitated men buried together, just like Cahokia's Mound 72. The big differences were that the other burials were all secondary burials, and there was no elite burial at the center. The landowner was a chiropractor, and the archaeologists saw the Cahokia sacrifices, so if these people were sacrificed, they would have said something. In Aslan, they found something they called the Princess Burial but no sacrifices around it, just bundles. Craig's Mound at Spiro had an amazing tomb chamber, sealed and full of thousands of artifacts. But unfortunately, that was not a controlled excavation. It was treasure hunters looting it. Bones were thrown everywhere as they dug, so we'll never really know what that one looked like. Back in Cahokia, shortly after Mound 72 went up, they built a two-mile-long palisade around their downtown. They fortified that wall multiple times before the city was abandoned in 1175 CE, much earlier than all the other Mississippian cities. We may never know, but maybe the rest of the Mississippian civilization didn't like all that sacrifice. Maybe they shut Cahokia down because of it. As time marched on, other cities increased in population and continued building burial mounds. Kincaid, Okmulgi, Angel, Etua, and Moundville, just to name a few, they all had burial mounds. But they had peaceful interments, each with elite burials containing amazing works of art and surrounded by bundle burials. Moundville had a CCC crew in the 1930s that excavated over 2,000 burials there. Decades later, an archaeologist named Christopher Peebles analyzed the entire excavation and came up with some interesting conclusions. Many of the burials were in abandoned house mounds, interred by people returning to Moundville well after its abandonment, around 1350 CE. He also found pairs of taller mounds, one a flat-top elite residence and another a ridge-top burial mound. He believed these represented the compounds of elite families, perhaps the heads of clans. I'm impressed by people's work. 
he showed us two important things when it comes to burial patterns. One, families were being buried in the same mound. That suggests that maybe those burial mounds were generational family crypts, at least some of them. That might also help to explain the multiple phases in each mound, their generations. The other was the fact that the dead continued to be interred after the fall of Moundville. It became a cemetery with an ancestor worship twist. Other places had burials after their abandonments, too. Toltec, I had already mentioned, had a lot of them. Cahokia also had some. They just weren't as clear as the examples in Moundville, and that was probably simply because less small house mounds were dug by archaeologists in those places. The CCC crew had hundreds of people that needed employment, and they dug all those mounds, sadly. In any event... It shows us that people's spirits were connected to ancestral places, not just where they were currently living. The last thing I want to talk about in this episode is the most famous Mississippian burial ceremony witnessed by Europeans. I'm talking about the funeral of the Natchez War Captain Tattooed Serpent in 1725. The Natchez were some of the last Mississippian holdouts, still building pyramid mounds. They lived right where modern-day Natchez, Mississippi is. Their paramount chief was a man named the Great Sun, a hereditary leadership title and position. A French trader named Le Page du Prats lived in their village and became good friends with the Great Sun. Tattooed Serpent was his brother and war captain. One night the wives of the great son woke Duprats up and begged him to go talk the son out of killing himself. His brother had died and he was beside himself with grief. The wives told Duprats that if the great son killed himself, that they had to do it as well, and they were not into that and they wanted Duprats to stop him. Duprats did talk him out of it, but then he saw the wives of Tattooed Serpent meet the same fate. At the funeral, as Tattooed Serpent's body was brought up a mound into a charnel house, his wives knelt along the path and were strangled to death as his body passed. There's a creepy drawing of it in Duprats's journal. Duprats didn't witness them get buried but he definitely witnessed a Mississippian sacrifice. So what's going on here? That sure sounds a lot like what we think happened at Cahokia, but that was 600 years earlier. Now, it could be that these kinds of female sacrifices were happening all along, and archaeology has just failed to detect it. Or maybe the Natchez returned to sacrifice as part of the post-apocalyptic world they were living in. It's hard to say, but one other thing that the Natchez did may be part of this puzzle. They had a matrilineal descent pattern with special rules for the elite classes. The next great son, as well as the chiefs of the lesser Natchez villages, had to be born to one of his daughters, not his sons. Further, that daughter had to marry someone from the lowest social class, a class Duprats called the Stinkards. If you chart that out and do the math for just a few generations, you quickly see that women capable of producing the next chiefs are in increasingly short supply. That gets me thinking. Did killing those women prevent them from being kingmakers? Winding the clock back, were all those sacrificed women at Cahokia a political power play that seized the kingdom for a specific family or clan? Now, I could be way off base there, but I'm going to give it more thought. This is a possibility. One of the reasons I love making this podcast is because it gives me a reason to think about those kinds of questions. But, speaking of this podcast... I'm out of time again for this episode.
So until next month, this is Ed, signing off. You've been listening to Archeo Ed, a podcast written, produced, and distributed by me, Ed Barnhart. If you liked what you heard, then subscribe, like, share, comment, and do all those other things that I'm supposed to ask you to do. If you didn't, then don't do any of that stuff. And if you really liked it, support Archeo Ed through my Patreon account. I make these podcasts for free, but I am not opposed to financial support. Until next time, thanks for listening. All rights reserved. Copyright 2022.